There we go. I think we're live, everyone. So good to see people today, see you guys today. It's been a long time since I caught up with you all and um, you've been doing some amazing things in this group teaching space. So let me admit everybody to the room uh, and we can get started with some of our questions and things today. So there we go. Uh, looks like we've got Karen, BJ, Leah, James. Uh, lots of people joining us, which is fantastic. So I'm Tim Topham, for those of you who haven't met me from Top Music, and uh, I really wanted to capture um, this opportunity to talk about group teaching right now because it's a bit of a hot topic and it has been in the past and then it kind of went a bit quieter again and now it seems to have really um, taken off in all the questions that we're getting. And I think it's a tribute to you three amazing women because you did a conference just recently an online conference called group illuminated all about group teaching and it went really really well so we might be able to talk about that later on but why don't we start with a quick introduction from each of you just letting us know where you are and your kind of perhaps your specialty and what your studio is a little bit like should we start with you marie Sure. Hi, I'm Marie Lee. I'm from Las Vegas. I've been teaching group piano for about 18 years. I was a private teacher before. And funny story, one of the moms that said, you need to check out group teaching was one of them. She's actually one of the moms of my students, um, private students, and she didn't end up signing up, which is kind of funny. But it ended up being the thing that I absolutely love. I've got uh, my own school here. I rent space from a um, uh, music store, piano store, and 130 students. So excited to see you. Thanks. Amazing. Dorla. Hello, my name is Dorla Aparicio. I live in Texas, south of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I have been teaching here for over 30 years. I also got started as a private piano teacher. And the last 30 years, I've been teaching both uh, private and group. And I have a, a boutique studio, 50 students, and uh, 10 of those are private. The rest are in group. Thank you, Dola. Lovely to have you here. And we've got a podcast episode coming up about this when we dive deeper into all the great things that you're doing. Um, Melanie, one of our inner circle or top music experts, welcome. Mm -hmm. Hi there, yeah, my name is Melanie Bowes. I'm from the UK, just south of London. Um, I've been teaching for 20 years, but started off actually as a school classroom teacher and then moved into group piano about oh, six years ago. And I've created a program called Keynotes Music. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. We've literally got people from every different continent and time zone almost here. I can see uh, Paul's joined us. Go, Paul, BJ, James, Karen, Leah, Sarah. If you guys have any questions at any stage, please either put up your hand or um, add a note in the chat. We'd love to get some of your questions answered. Uh, but we also had some prior submissions of questions. So they're the ones I thought we'd get to first. And then we'll um, add, answer ones in the group um, here today as well when we can. So the questions uh, seem to hover around um, we've got a question about online group teaching and how that or how on earth that's even <laughs> possible i wondered the same thing um multi-level teaching so how you can successfully teach multiple people of different ages and abilities in one room at one time uh, and then things like hourly rates and how you charge so i might actually start there if that's all right beck stewart asked um she has she said i've had events where i've charged my hourly rate divided by the number of students but then some students didn't commit so i earned less than private teaching and other events where families didn't want to commit because i was charging too much so let's talk about pricing for group lessons more less the same as your hourly rate um should we start with marie uh, i would say the same um, there are so many different benefits that you do not get from a private studio. And there's nothing wrong with private lessons because that's all how we learned. Um, and I think it really does come back to what the parent's goal is for their child. Um, if their goal is to become a concert pianist, I tell my parents right then, this is not the place for you. If you want a child that's going to love music the rest of their lives, this is this is where you need to start. I always offer the first lesson for free too, because I want to get them in the door. Um, and, and I know, and this is this is something that I probably everybody has seen this and if you can get them in the door they stay they sign up so 99% of the time they will stay but you've got to get them in the door so I have no problem offering one for free but yes you charge exactly what you're worth because it takes a lot more like setup you've got to buy more pianos you've got to have um 
just the space to be able to offer offer that. So I would definitely price just as much, maybe even a bit more. But and and sometimes too, I think we've talked about this, is that a higher price to people means maybe better quality. So there's nothing wrong with that. Don't don't be too cheap. Mm, thank you, Melanie. What's your thoughts? My thoughts are that um, I teach eight students per half an hour. And so the rate that I charge is less than what a private rate would be for the parent. But my income is way higher than what I would be earning if I was just teaching one to one. So to my mind, everyone's a winner. Um, I do three week trials. But as Marie says, every, I have 100 percent sign up from that three week trial and I do charge for it because I was finding that with free trials sometimes they weren't turning up and then wasting your time and if you've only got um, a certain number of spaces in your group you need to be sure that everyone's going to be there so by having them pay up front for that trial you know they're going to be there. Thank you. So just for, for someone who's thinking about uh, pricing this let's say they're just starting out a group of two students uh, and they were charging, should we keep it simple, round figures, $100 an hour. That's doing pretty well, perhaps in some areas. What, what would you, how would you break that down for the parent? So if you were charging $100 to see one student for one hour and now you've got two, what might you do, Melanie? Well, I wouldn't see one student for one hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for half an hour, $50 for half an hour then. Okay, $50 for half an hour. I mean, I would... A lot of people say kind of 60, 65%, but if you've only got two people, then that's not, it's actually going to be way more than that. So um, oh, with two, I, I wouldn't teach a group of two, I only do eight. So maybe you want to pass that question on to someone else. <laughs> Dola, we haven't asked you, have you got any thoughts on this as well? I, I do. Um, I would say first, you need to think about what your expenses are going to be and then how much money you want to make, and then decide on your price. So I charge the same for, just like Marie, my private 30-minute uh, lessons are the same price as a group for 60 minutes. But I priced it that way because I figured out how much I need to make per hour to keep the studio running. Mm. So I wouldn't break it down depending on how many students are in the class sometimes i only have two or three in the class but because i have uh priced it to where i know how much i need to make per hour having two students is okay for me great uh for those who have just joined as well please let me know if you've got any questions if you're in the group put your hand up or if you're happy to ask a question or you can put it in the chat i'd love to get your questions answered and thank you for being here today it's wonderful to see so many people uh, okay, let's um, go on to um, placing kids in, in a group setting. So you've, it seems that you've got two schools of thought here. One is you have uh, multi-age groups and Dola, I'll ask you about those or, or multi-level groups, we should say, um, or you can put them in cohorts of the same skill level, which will often mean the same age, but not always, I guess. Um, so what, where do you, what advice would you say here? Um, should we start with Melanie? Yeah, so I I would have um, beginners by age because your four and five year olds are going to have very different needs and need to kind of have shorter activities, different activities um, than your older children. So I go four to five for beginners and then I do six to nine or ten and then I do um, older beginners and adults. So those are like the beginner program. But of course, with music learning, it's not really age-based, it's stage-based, isn't it? Once they get past those beginner stages, um, they're progressing according to their skills and their understanding of concepts, etc. So I start them in age as beginners, but then the ages are relevant as they build their skills. Is that your approach, Marie? Yeah, right on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if you're starting, that's Melanie's right. The best place to start is actually with beginners that are not transfer students. You start them fresh um, and by age, um, just like Melanie said. And then I'm always on the lookout. I'm lucky because I've been doing this a while and I have a lot of classes. So if I see a child 
that is progressing a little bit faster. I know that will probably come up where people are like, what do you do with a kid that's progressing faster? I have places where I can put them. I have another class. So I do the same level teaching on like Dorla, which does multi-level, which leaves a whole lot more options for that. Um, but if I see a child a little faster, I'll move them in here. If I see a child, maybe, um, and I'm not going to say slower because we can all learn piano, but maybe one that doesn't put in the effort as much as another, then um, I try and group my kids kind of according to um, mentality levels. Is that kind of, is that a good word? Like, <laughs> much, levels. yeah, I don't know. Commitment levels. Thank you. If I've got like the go-getter class, I want that class together. And, and so I can move kids around and I'm always doing that, but I have the flexibility of doing that. Not, I realize not everybody does that either. Well, I feel lucky because Dollar and I got to catch up with a podcast recording not long ago. So I know a little about the multi-level grouping that the Dollar does. And I know that one of the advantages of that is that you don't have to shift kids between groups. So if they're making great friends in one group and they get really good, they don't have to move out of that group. So Dollar, can you tell us, um, and sorry, you're probably sick of explaining this, but I know so many people are interested. How do you teach these multi-level groups of kids? So, um, Marie and Melanie are very blessed to have such an amount of a hundred students. I have half of that. So I don't have a, a place to move them to. So I had to figure out a way to be able to allow them to move up to another level if they needed to, but within the same class. So I also um, have my beginners ages four to seven in their same age grouping because as Melanie said um, there's specific things that they need to do and they're not as independent but once they are eight between um, ages 8 to 11 I will group them together and 11 to 14 and within those ages I have early uh, I'm sorry beginner to early intermediate that they can be in the same class and if they are uh, more committed, then they can move to the next level, but stay in the same class. And I do that with ensemble based pieces. Mm. So, and I think I'm right in saying that in all your group settings, uh, there's lots of music playing out loud. Would that be a fair, fair statement? Yes. <laughs> because there's obviously that other option, which um, we hear about, which is headphones on and you're teaching, um, you're effectively teaching individual students in one room at the same time. But that's a completely different uh, situation to what we're talking about today. Uh, have any of you experienced that or do you have any thoughts on the, the sort of key benefits uh, one to the other? I think making music together has to be the key benefit for this collaborative setting that we're talking about here. And I think when you talk about the benefits of groups, you are really talking about the, the social learning, the peer motivation, but also just coming down to the music and the fact that when children or adults make music with other people, they get a very um, joyful experience and it's very um, impactful and meaningful for them. So if we can arrange our classes so that they are learning together and they're playing together, I think that's where we get the, the most benefit from group classes. Mm. It's where they have and, the most fun too, right? And we can take a, a huge lesson from like bands, like marching bands, that these kids are friends for life. My, my brothers and sisters all did marching band. And it's like, that's what we are. We're, we're trying to build a, a piano band. And these are kids that are friends for life and they keep playing for life. Hmm. Uh, we've got a question from Sarah in the chat. You guys may be able to see that. Do you get to the point where a student is progressing so fast and showing promise uh, that you have to struggle, uh, suggest that they change to one-on-one -on -one, or if you only teach groups to move them to a teacher who will take them on? Does this happen often and how do you approach this? I'm mainly teaching one-on-one -on -one with many who like to aim for exams so I can do this switch eventually. Uh, anyone want to take that one? I'll take it. Um, so if I have a student that is going... Um, beyond the early intermediate level, then yes, I will invite them to um, go into private lessons. Um, that's what my private lessons are for, for those students who are progressing on their own and are very independent and very committed. 
So mm-hmm. I would not, you know, keep them in the group. And, I, oh, go ahead. Go no, go ahead, Mary. Oh, I have a teacher friend. I just thought about this. I I think this would be the ideal. And I, she pulled it off because she had a smaller um, base of students, but she had these really committed students. And she taught. Um, everybody had a private lesson once a week, and they got a group class once a week. And I think that would be the ideal. But very few of us have um, the space or the time to do that. But but yeah, there's there's benefits to both. If you could put them both together, that would be awesome. And then you could do that. Um, Sarah, you could move as fast or as slow as they want during their private lesson and then use their group class for the ensemble material. I know we've got um, Paul Myatt in the group as well. Paul, um, if you could just uh, unmute for a second, Paul, because you teach uh, exam groups in Australia here right up to gra- higher grades, four or five in a room together, and they go for their exam at the same time. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. They, and It's all about taking them together and uh, exactly what marie said they um they are friends and they work together um and the so the thing about exam levels i've got kids i've got seven classes at the moment from grade two to grade eight so i've got four kids in my grade eight class which is fairly high level and they have a private lesson as well so they're private and class but up to about grade four or five they just have um, class lessons, the occasional private lesson for final technique, but they all work together and they tend to stay together. Um, but uh, I think someone was saying it's great to have classes that you can move them ahead to. It makes such a difference. Mm, thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Sarah, I hope that's answered your questions. Let me know if you've got any follow-ups to that one. It's a great question as well. Um, one of the other questions that has come up a bit is uh, formatting the lessons. Now, I, I guess, and Rebecca Penner asked this over on our Facebook group, I, I assume she means the, the structure of the actual lesson. Um, do you all tend to have a fairly structured lesson plan with um, you know, an ensemble activity to start, some oral activities at the beginning, sight reading, that sort of thing? Or is it really quite mixed? Um, like we would do perhaps, I guess any teacher will either have a really structured format or be quite free as well. Um, mm-hmm. Marie, Marie, any thoughts on that? I do. I actually, um, I kind of plot out my my outline for the year. Um, and we do, we don't do exams, but we do festivals here, which is a lighter version of that. And so we're, our students are working toward a solo festival where they play in front of judges and then also ensemble festival. So that takes a lot of um, my curriculum and I group it into what we need to get ready for those um, as I'm, as I'm planning those. And then, yeah, I'm trying to get, you know, some improvisation and some technique um, theory work, a rhythm work. And so I, I always have more on my lesson plan than I will ever get to. Um, that's a good, good place to start. Just have way more than you'll ever get to, and then you won't run out. Um, but yeah, we're working towards those things. And so I have, like I said, the huge outline for the year of what we need to get to and what we need to get accomplished. But I always leave some wiggle room and not everybody um, likes or is comfortable with this, but, but I mentioned this at one of our group illuminated chats. It's like, when um bruno we don't talk about bruno comes along i'm not gonna wait we're gonna teach it right then because it's hot it's fun and the kids want to do it so i do live a little bit of wiggle room i feel i feel feel better with that but some people need it a little more structured and there's nothing wrong with that either i learned as a classroom teacher always good to have too many activities planned (laughs) than not enough it's the same it's it's a group format in the same way uh melanie or dola any thoughts on that question Yeah, I think that you do need a kind of consistent structure from week to week um, because the kids need to know what to expect. Um, Once they do and their expectations are met, they are then in their sweet spot for learning because if it's chaotic and unplanned, and then they will be chaotic and um, a a bit frantic. So a, a really clear structure that's consistent from week to week is really good. And obviously changing up the content each week so that it's progressive I have like really clear learning objectives for each lesson what the skills we're going to learn how are they going to show me that that they've learned it so evidencing how am I going to monitor and give feedback and what's the actual content going to be to achieve those learning objectives thanks Melanie Dola any anything else to add well I I do the same I plan my whole semester sometimes my whole year 32 weeks And I plan specific ensemble pieces. I plan specific solo pieces, and then I leave room 
for assessments and for those fun pieces also. Hmm. Now, I want to mention just a quick interlude because, uh, James, you've asked a question about online uh, lessons and we had a couple of um, questions about online. So I want to get to that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but one of the uh, things that we were lucky enough to have happen to us last year is we were able to take on the Upbeat Piano Teachers resources. And one of the um, lessons in here, one of the, the workshops that they put together was this Group Lessons 101. And I wanted to give this to everyone on the call right now. Um, it's listed as $69, but if you just click on the processing sign, so just go to upbeatpianoteachers.com, click on that and then add coupon code group, uh, group fun uh, and apply, that will be uh, reduced to free. So I'd love to give that away. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the Upbeat Piano Teachers, this was Tracy Selly and Sarah Campbell who were interviewing lots of people all about all the different aspects of group teaching. In fact, Marie, I think you were featured, would that be right? I am, yeah. That yeah, was Dola little... maybe as well. I, I think. think so. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see. I can't jump in right now. Sarah, Daniel McFarlane, um, Carol, Susan Parody, Karen Gibson, lots of great names anyway. But that's all free. If you want to go and grab it, please jump over there at um, upbeatpianoteachers.com. Uh, all right, so let's get to the group teaching question. James in the chat uh, has asked a question. Sorry, um, online group. Uh, so, and I know Dorla, you are uh, still teaching this way. I think Marie and Melanie, we could say that we all did some group <laughs> online lessons. But just before I get to Dorla with some details, Marie and Melanie, are you guys still doing any online teaching? I no. only do if somebody said, yeah, and not even that. I just, you know, people ask if they can join a class um, online and it's just too difficult. So, so I, I'm using Tonara. If there's kids really that cannot come in, um, I just do some videos at home and share them that way too. But yeah, online, I'm glad we tried it. We know that we can do it, um, but not yeah. my favorite. It was a lot of work <laughs> as everybody <laughs> knows. <laughs> Melanie, did you feel the same? Oh, um, I think there are some <laughs> wonderful things about online teaching and I have enormous respect for people that want to, um, you know, teach in this way. And I think it opens up their lessons and their their teaching expertise to so many more people, you know, potentially. Um, I think you, you need to definitely set it up so that it's engaging enough for children at home. The thing that I missed most when I was teaching online, of course, is the ensemble playing um, and the lack of being able to do that. But having said which, on the, for the two, I think we were online for two terms in the end, the kids made really good progress. So I wasn't grumbling about that at all. And whether that was because the parents are sitting with them I was saying, like, if you've done it this way, this is how you can do it because I give different challenge levels out. And the parents were like, oh, OK, this is how it works. And so they were kind of really supporting their kids because they want if there's any element of competition, they wanted their kids to up level. And so I found that actually the kids made really good progress, but I missed them a lot. You mm. know, but that's just me in the way that I am. Some people love teaching online, so... So, uh, Dola, let's dig into this question of online. But uh, just before that, I'll just mention if you are watching this on YouTube uh, or on Facebook live stream, then uh, I'm looking, I found the chat now. So if you've got any questions on any of those platforms, please uh, pop a note, say hi firstly, so I know you're there. And then if you've got any questions, please let us know. Uh, Dola, tell us, how do you go about online group lessons? Well, just like Marie and Melanie, I do not like teaching group piano online or piano at all online, but I do it. And um, I do a lot of hybrid lessons. I have many uh, families that are further, like an hour away, and they can't always be here. So I'd have, before I was trying to do all these different things and trying different platforms, and I had to just streamline and make it easy because sometimes there's emergencies and we have to lock down the studio and be only online. Like when I was um, in contact with someone that had COVID or there was a shooting a mile away and the parents were concerned about coming, we had to just be online. So what I do is I use Zoom because um, it's easy. I'm already used to it. I don't want to learn something new. 
and it works fine. Everybody knows how to use it, so I use Zoom. And then the format for my lesson stays the same. Um, the only thing I modify is the game to, and my games are all very simple because I don't want to have to deal with internet issues. So, you know, flashcards, dice, that type of thing. Then in order to play together, we know that is not possible. Um, so what I do is just, you know, everyone's muted and they play with me. They're playing a duet with me. No one's complained. Parents don't complain about it. The kids don't because they're playing with me. They hear me. And then we take turns doing that. Or they can uh, be the leader of the whole group. So there's different things that we can do. But the most important thing is that I leave my format the same and I make it easy for me to be able to have um, the lesson. I saw, James, that you also asked how many students to have online. And I I had a class with six and that was the wrong decision. So four, I think four, maybe five is ideal, but six or more, it's, it, it didn't work for me. I think I, it's good I, to I, go on, sorry, I was gonna say I, I carried on with my eight and that worked fine. So just, you know, for another perspective, um, yeah, it's. It, it just depends well, on how you go about managing it, I guess. Uh, and how much uh, pressure you want to put yourself under, perhaps. Dolora, I love that that uh, comment that you said. It's, you, you know, you can't play at the same time and hear both people at the same time. But if you play or one person plays and everyone else mutes themselves, they can play in time with that person in their own space and it will sound okay to them. And I think that's a good thing to remember. So it's not impossible to play along. You just can't all play together in the same way that you can obviously with a live lesson. Um, I hope that's helped answer that question. James, please let me know if you've got any uh, follow-ups. Thanks, uh, Dola, for <laughs> letting us know how that all works. Um, I see Sarah's followed up with another question, uh, this time more about um, school and holiday times. So she says, do you only manage to teach your regular groups during school time and no lessons during the school holidays or are group workshops successful and popular during the school holidays? Uh, well, I certainly have heard lots of great stories of teachers who teach actually one on one predominantly running group classes once a month or a few times a term uh, as uh, one an add on an added benefit for their students, um, extra income for them as well, of course. Uh, so um, I think that's the question that's being asked. So for, for you that run it all during school time, do you also do things on the holidays? Uh, perhaps Marie to start? Yeah, it's not, it's not optional. Sorry, we do summer piano. Um, I do an abbreviated schedule. So and I'm happy to share my schedule if anybody wants it. But um, I guarantee this many lessons during the school year. And then I, I guarantee eight lessons, eight classes during um, June, July and August. And so it's not every single week. But um, like I mentioned before, we're working toward ensemble festival. And that is typically here um, in October. And so that's my big reason that they need to be here because they they need to learn those pieces and be ready um, to put that in front of a judge when they get back and you know into school and we can we combine parts and so it is not optional now I do give I do I'm super flexible with makeups and because so many kids are traveling if somebody can't make it one week I already know that they can fit into another class so that's another benefit of having a lot of classes I have a couple kids that leave for the whole summer they they are loaded and they get to travel to exotic locations and I I will do zoom classes with them or I'm meeting with some kids tomorrow that have been gone the whole summer privately and so I'll do that I'm not thrilled to do that but if it keeps them in my studio and they're kids that I want to keep then I'll work with that for summer but but summer regular yeah we all know we just need to be regular with with piano they lose too much they lose way too much if you don't option I do it and so I don't do special workshops either so I keep it really easy we're just continuing with classes Melanie, I wonder if summertime's like the same as in Australia for the UK, where the summer camp thing is not a thing for us. No, so and Sarah, well, Sarah's in the UK, so I was going to say that's actually quite a different answer, really, in the sense that we don't have all this time off. We just have the six weeks, and people will go away, and it will be difficult to schedule groups. But I would suggest, and I know you've been doing this this summer, Sarah, is to have like smaller workshops on a few days in a row 
um so that people know that they can commit to that week like even with my kids if they go to a netball camp or a tennis camp camps are growing here in the UK I don't know about for you Tim but they are definitely growing here and um you know I know which weeks I'm going to be away and which weeks I'm going to be my kids are going to be able to go into some activities so um instead of kind of getting them to do it right through the summer and like once a week for six weeks, I would suggest you you run a, a summer camp basically just on a few days in, in one week and then maybe a different one. And it can be like themed, it can have a topic. Um, yeah, that would be my suggestion because we do have much shorter summer holidays here. Mm. Dollar, any thoughts on that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I used to do piano camps every summer. Um, Late oh, I've, I found them on your website. You've got the most amazing collection for anyone that wants to find summer camp ideas for group piano. My goodness, you have to go to Dollar's website. We'll, t we'll tell you. everyone your websites after this. Okay. So, but for the last uh, three or four years, it really, there's too much competition. Everybody's doing camps now. So for my parents, what I did is I just kept the schedule the same during June and July, offering eight weeks. But what I do is I use my piano camp themes for our regular lessons. And then for those students who are traveling out of the country or doing whatever and they can't be here, I let them join online. And I also create a virtual piano studio on my website where they can um, watch a video of me teaching and they can stay on track with everything that we're doing if they want to. I note your follow up there, Sarah. Uh, and I did a podcast. Um, I wish I could find the name of it, but you might be able to Google for it about a summer camp in Australia that was run by uh, a couple of teachers. They combined with a local art school and they did this great artistic creative program. Uh, so it is something that is done on a small basis. It hasn't got the same um, whole <laughs> whole thing that it is in the, in the United States. But interesting to hear what you said, Melanie, about the fact that that might be growing. Uh, which makes a bit of sense too. So um, before we get to our last couple of questions, I did want to ask about multi-level repertoire and some of your favorite resources, I think more generally would be great. But before that, uh, a quick um, opportunity to let people know where they can find out more about you and connect with you, each of you. So uh, Dorla, where can people go? Because you also, we should mention too, you have your own multi-level group method called Piano Pyramid. Do you want to tell us briefly about that and where they can go to find out more? You can go to MissDorla.com, M-I-S-S-D-O-R-L-A. And yes, I um, created Piano Pyramid for multi-level group piano. So this ensemble pieces that we use are for beginner to early intermediate. And so we all learn to play the same song together out loud. But... Um, if you think of your primer level songs in any primer level book, that same structure, the same sound is what you would have in Piano Pyramid, just that it will be combined with an early intermediate piece by any of the, you know, classical composers that we are used to, to uh, teaching in a private lesson. So that's really how it works. So each level um, is playing something a little more difficult but they can all be played together. And that's Piano Pyramid. Great. Marie, where can people find out more about all the great things you're up to? Um, I'm musicalityschools at gmail.com, but I do have some resources. Leela Viss and I connected. And so I'm actually on her shop. Um, I've written a, a book. Leela forced me to write a book called The um, Group Teaching Blueprint. She pushed me to get that one out there. So that's kind of all my experience. Uh, it's about 150 pages, but that's on Leela Viss. I think if you just hit shop, you can scroll down. Lola, Dorla, your camps, I think, are still on Leela's site as well. So yeah, she has a few places for, for us people that like to sell a few little things. So check out leelavis.com, probably shop. Fantastic. Thanks. And Melanie? So my um, program is called Keynotes Music, and it's specifically written for groups with um, the kind of differentiated learning included into the lesson plans where you have, you know, even if you had a group of beginners, they're all going to be progressing at different rates from the very start, but we want to keep them on the same songs. 
So we have a plan for adding depth to each song so that they can kind of progress within each piece. Um, and we also use cyclical curriculum structures to solve some of the problems that group teachers face. So the website is keynotes-music.com. Thank you very much. So I want to get to two final questions after this, um, which is um, repertoire and resources. So repertoire for multi-levels, which Dola might be able to make some suggestions on, and then more generally some some any other sort of final resources out there. So people watching, I'm going to check the chat on our other live streams uh, and in here as well. So this is your last opportunity. If you do have any questions, please uh, let us know. I also wanted to mention, of course, inside our Top Music Pro membership, uh, this is actually the dashboard that you land on as a, as a member coming in, giving us an update of what's actually coming up. But if I just click Academy at the top, this is where we keep all of our courses and resources so let me give you a like 30 second look i'm just going to click on the group teaching subject so you can see um, some of the resources that we have over here including a whole ton of courses in fact one by melanie right here <laughs> so if i click on group teaching we've got about 38 resources in here um, including some uh, discounts some masterminds webinars teaching demos. We have uh, Melanie's course, which is all about the business of group teaching. Uh, Nicola recorded some really great lessons and courses actually on uh, the various different ways that you can add more than one child in a lesson without necessarily calling it group. Um, so buddies and pairs and lab time and 3030s and these things. If you've heard of any of those other kinds of structures, then we've got a great course on that, which answers lots of those questions. And then we've got our Growing a Group Teaching Studio course, um, which Deborah Perez put together for us. Live teaching, playing in ensembles, that's Paul actually um, in action there and Paul here as well. Uh, so we've got lots of resources to suit our group teaching community over in Top Music Pro. Just wanted to give you a quick look there. If you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, topmusicpro.com. Okay, let's wrap up with that question, um, Dola, perhaps, um, on the multi-level repertoire. Any suggestions there? Well, I always um, tell teachers you can start with trios. There are many on Piano Pronto. Um, trios and uh, duets, you can have them double up on duets. Um, also, Susan Staples Bell has been writing more and more um, multi-level uh, piano ensembles, and then of course, Piano Pyramid. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, should we mention um, also Mayron and the work that she's done too? And I know she was a guest, she was your keynote speaker at your conference and she came on my podcast probably five years ago or something now. Uh, and she's got some information at freepianomethod.com, I think is right. Um, Melanie, any suggestions for either repertoire or resources other than keynotes, of course? Well, I was going to say Susan Staples Bell as well. And um, Dorla, of course, has got some pieces on your website, haven't you, Dorla? Um, and I've heard people talk about the ensembles on the Mayor and Cole site as well. Um, yeah, and obviously keynotes, but that's you can't really dip into keynotes. It's a, it's a whole kind of teaching curriculum. So, um, but there are obviously ensembles there as well. Mm. And Marie. I know I'm writing my list and then um, a lot of them have been mentioned too. So yeah, do check out May runs because they're free. Um, and that's what we used a million years ago. And they're still cute as can be. I have some fun ones on there that my kids still really like. Um, Deborah Perez's piano band that's new is really fun. And she's got probably some of the best backing tracks I've ever heard. Mm. So check, check those out. Yeah, if you I haven't think... looked. Yeah, she rocks. Like everybody loves the backing tracks, even the yep. adults, the teens, they're good. Will um, Bailey is uh, he's fantastic. He is. Yeah. And he has some things too as well you've got to kind of dig for him but he does have some some ensembles as well my adults have liked a lot of his stuff and and I, he might sell it might be like a membership and then he's got backing tracks but it's pretty reasonable um, Melody Bober has some awesome trios and I just know about those just because we do the um national fest sorry national federation of music clubs and that's full of ideas for ensembles um as well it goes i think all the way up to maybe quintets maybe so that's just pull up one of their one of their books and they've got a ton of lists of just of different ideas 
Thank you so much. Well, before I ask you for your final sort of comments or uh, supportive suggestions for teachers who are watching and interested in this but may not have taken the leap yet, uh, there was one other question that's come through on Facebook. No, on YouTube. Do any of you compose repertoire for the groups you teach? I think we've kind of uh, covered that one. Um, that is from Sailor Auntie, whoever Sailor Auntie is. Uh, go back, have a look at the recording. Um, all of these three ladies create amazing things for their group teaching resources. So um, any final comments? Uh, we'll just go through each of you quickly and then we'll wrap things up. Um, Melanie. Well, I think that, that, you know, I've heard, I've spoken to so many teachers who have some concerns before they start group. Um, and my best advice is always just to get started because once they do, they never look back and these concerns are no longer concerns because they've got happy children, they're a happy teacher. And um, so that's kind of a big a big piece of advice is just to get started. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> I like it. Mate, take the leap, give it a shot. But you also don't have to go to eight kids. You've, you've got rooms of eight now that's a lot and that's an investment in instruments and things like that you don't have to start with that many you can start with two or three just you know make make a start somewhere uh yes. dollar yes you can start with two or three uh, beginners at one piano and get your feet wet understand what it is you want to do with your group piano program and then grow from there you don't have to make a big spend of money or you know move all your studio around or do anything that big you can just start small just find um other find peers that will be able to guide you into what you know there's a lot of information out there nowadays um very different from when marie and i started so you know ask for help and just get started and marie as well um, it is the most fun you will ever have teaching. I love groups and I love the energy that's in there. And I love the friendships that they make. I just, it's, there's just something about the energy making music. is just a beautiful spiritual thing anyway, but when you can do it with other people, it just is, is that much more, but Dorla's right. You don't have to in invent anything new. If I were to get started and which I did, I went right to Mayron Cole's method. Um, and it gave me the confidence. Everything was laid out. Um, but pick a method, pick, you know, keynotes or Dorla's or Mayron's and just get something that has already been written. And then after a couple of years, you tweak it. And then if you want to add something in, then you do that. But, but I would just start with something that someone else has already written. Um, don't reinvent it, get the confidence up, and then you can start to expand and bring in your own personality wherever you need to. I wrote an article recently about the memories that I have as a child learning music and as a teenager the, the only things I can remember that are good. <laughs> so I've got some memories of recitals that didn't go well or exams or whatever it was, but the positive memories are all when I'm doing things with other people, when I'm accompanying a singer or I'm playing in the sh band for the musical at the school or the orchestra or whatever it was. And I think that's really instructive to note that the memories that you are all making in your group studios are ones that the kids will have for a very long time, hopefully for life. So uh, thank you all so much for coming um, and chatting today, it's been so much fun and been a great opportunity to catch up. We don't do this often enough and I haven't, I haven't seen Melanie and Marie for ages and Dola, we've only just met in the last few months. So thanks again. And thank you to all of you out there who are watching on our streaming services and have been in the group today. Appreciate your questions. Good luck with your group teaching and have a great rest of the week ahead. Thank you, everybody. Right, Bye to Melanie, Dola and Marie. Thanks again, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.